Thank you very much indeed, Lucy. Before um, I, I will return to, to the member mo momentarily. Um, before we move on to the next item of business, I wish to address an issue which occurred at the Equality, Human Rights and Civil Justice Committee this morning, which members may be aware of and which members have raised with me. At that meeting, a visitor to the public gallery was asked to remove a purple, green and white scarf. Having declined to do so, the visitor was informed that she would not be able to return to the gallery. This request was made by officials in connection with the Parliament's Code of Conduct for Visitors, which sets out that the display of banners, flags or political slogans, including on clothing and accessories, is forbidden. Let me make one thing crystal clear. Suffrage colours are not and never have been banned at the Scottish Parliament. We actively support and promote universal suffrage in a number of ways at Holyrood, and we will continue to do so. I would like to advise the Chamber that the action taken this morning was not prompted by any members of the committee. The action taken was an error, and I would like to apologise on behalf of the Parliament. The wearing of a scarf in those colours does not in itself breach the visitor code of conduct. The Parliament wishes people to engage with the Democratic democratic process, including observing elected representatives debate and make the law of the country. Thank you. Um, Rachel Hamilton. Uh, can I thank the uh, presiding officer for making it clear um, that no breach uh, had occurred within the Equalities Committee this morning because I had planned to make a point of order regarding this particular issue, presiding officer. I think it's important that you have um, confirmed that MSPs are treated exactly the same way as the members of the public and the suffragette colours were not in breach of the guidelines um, set by this Parliament. So can I thank you for your intervention and for sharing that with Parliament and being clear regarding that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Hamilton. We will now... The point of order, Stephen Kerr. Um, President officer, I seek your guidance on comments. The Minister for Higher Education Further Education, Youth Employment and Training, Jamie Hepburn, MSP, made in this chamber, which do not appear to have any resemblance to accuracy. On the 27th of October in this chamber, Mr Hepburn said, there is no freeze on apprenticeships this year. There are still many places available to be taken up in the contracts that have been awarded and they should be fulfilled. Let us be clear, he said, there is no freeze on apprenticeship places this year. Well, training providers have been in contact with many of us in this chamber to make it clear that they have been told something very different by Skills Development Scotland. At the start of the financial year, training providers were told they could utilise the process for requesting additional starts as long as they met their key performance indicators, as has been the standard practice in many previous years. However, last month, despite meeting all their key performance indicators, Training providers were told that as a result of John Swinney's announcements, Skills Development Scotland were unable to process any further requests for additional volume or value to provide modern apprenticeship qualifications. This removes the ability of the training providers to respond to the training needs of our businesses and provide opportunities for our young people. Presiding officer, the practice has always been that training providers can apply for additional places halfway through the year to allow flexibility in the labour market. They had received assurances to the effect that this would continue. Now, I know that Mr Hepburn has received the same correspondence that I and many other members have received from training providers. So this normal practice has ended and the number of places on apprenticeships is frozen. And yet Mr Hepburn said there was no freeze on apprenticeships. Well, there is. This feels more than a little misleading. And I wonder, presiding officer, what options exist for members to have Mr Hepburn come to the chamber to explain what he meant by, quote, there is no freeze on apprenticeships this year, unquote, when there clearly is a freeze on apprenticeships. If he has inadvertently misled Parliament, he should put the record straight. What sanctions exist? And, is there, and if there has been a change, since the Minister spoke, just a few days ago in relative terms, would it not be normal practice for the Minister to come to Parliament and inform Parliament? 
I thank Mr Kerr for his point of order. It is of paramount importance that members, including ministers, give accurate information to the Parliament, correcting any inadvertent errors at the earliest opportunity. If any member has a question about the factual accuracy of another member's contribution, they should raise it uh, with that member. The Chamber is fully... I I'm sure all members here are aware that the Parliament has a corrections procedure and how that mechanism operates. I haven't received a request to make a statement. If a member considers that a statement should be made, they should raise that directly with the relevant member. If a request to make a statement was received, I would notify the Parliamentary Bureau so that time could be scheduled, set aside. Um, these points, the, the points that I am making, have been that they reflect the procedures and the practices that have been agreed by this Parliament. But, of course, if anyone considers that these should be revised, they can, of course, raise that matter with the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee. We will now move on to the next item of business, which is topical questions. And at question number one, I call Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to reports that its claim that Scotland has 25% of Europe's offshore wind potential lacks evidence and that it knew there was no basis for it. Minister Lorna Slater. The figure relating to Scotland having 25% of Europe's offshore wind potential was first set out back in a 2010 publication. It is now out of date. However, this does not change the fact that Scotland already has an important offshore wind sector and we have huge potential to grow this and become a global leader with over 40 gigawatts of potential offshore wind developments already in the pipeline. Liam Kerr. Thank the Minister for that answer, but I'm afraid the Minister has completely missed the point. Presiding Officer, everyone wants the renewables industry to succeed, but this will not be achieved by Ministers putting out dodgy data. Only a couple of weeks ago, I made a point of order, as the First Minister had misrepresented Scotland's energy consumption from renewables. Instead of doing the honourable thing and publicly admitting our mistake, she quietly amended the official record. So it seems the misrepresentation and misuse of data might be endemic within this government. The Civil Service apparently knew the data was not true several years ago. So, Minister, when did ministers first become aware that what they were using, or that they were using a figure that, to quote Scottish Government officials, hadn't been properly sourced. Minister. Uh, ministers became aware of the issue on Tuesday, the 8th of November, ahead of the publication of the report by these islands. What the change, uh, what the statistic doesn't what doesn't change about the statistic is the amount of renewable energy potential that Scotland has, which is still significant and is part of our future energy provision in Scotland now and as an independent country. With over 40 gigawatts, that's in the pipeline already, presuming planning decisions and finding a route to market, which is the equivalent of producing enough electricity to power every home in Scotland for 17 years. Liam Kerr. That answer, but once again, she has completely missed the point. The claim was that Scotland has 25% of the potential. And the bogus statistic, which civil servants and ministers knew was wrong, has been repeated ad nauseam. This chamber has heard it, either here or in the course of their duties, from First Minister Sturgeon, Deputy First Minister Swinney, Minister Todd, Minister McPherson, Minister Robertson, Minister Matheson, and Minister Slater. Minister... The Ministerial Code at section 1.3c says it is of paramount importance that ministers give accurate and truthful information to the Parliament, correcting any inadvertent error at the earliest opportunity. Ministers who knowingly mislead the Parliament will be expected to offer their resignation to the First Minister. So now that I am raising this with the member, as the presiding officer just asked us to do, what action is the minister taking to ensure that the ministerial code is always complied with. Minister. Scottish ministers understood that the statistic was accurate at the time that they cited it. Now that it has come to our attention that it is not, we are working to update statistics on how our offshore wind potential compares to other countries. 
we will update Parliament once this is done, and at that point, we will consider how any legacy documents may need to be updated. But the key point is that Scotland's enormous potential for offshore wind yep. has that not changed. Point. In fact, we have made Members. big progress in recent years with, as I've said, 40 gigawatts now in the pipeline. Yeah. Thank you. I call Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. We know that the claim Scotland had 25% of Europe's offshore wind was always uh, untrue. Just as the claim that, that, that the constantly deplete that nearly 100% of the electricity we consume comes from renewables isn't actually true either. But let's turn to another figure. The Scottish Government promised there would be 120,000 renewable jobs per year by 2020. Can the Minister tell us? Was that target reached? Is that still the target? And just how many of those supply chain jobs from the offshoring of the Scotland uh, leases will actually be created in Scottish businesses, not foreign owned businesses? Minister. Uh, thank the member very much for the question. We are, of course, all keen to ensure that the development of the offshore wind industry benefits Scotland's businesses and our economy. Initial supply chain commitments around Scotland indicate an average of £1.4 billion of investment in Scotland per project, which equates to £28 billion of investment across the 20 projects. Fergus Ewing. Uh, also, I hope that all of us here are here in order not to play politics about the past, but to propel progress in future. And to that end, can I reflect that when I was Energy Minister, one of the most frustrating experiences, presiding officer, was that it could take 12 years to get consent for, say, a wind farm onshore, which it took 12 months to construct. Therefore, can I make the suggestion to the minister that the Scottish Government review the processes for obtaining permissions, licenses and consents for on and offshore developments and subsea cables and particularly grid connections with a view to simplifying shortening and streamlining them and that the Scottish Government should, in order to achieve success throughout these islands, engage with the UK Government in order to try to identify one lead body that can guide this process. Otherwise, I fear that many of the projects that we all wish to see may be thwarted and jeopardised through delay. I thank the member for his question. However, it does not bear relation um, to the substantive question on the paper. Therefore, I will ask that the Minister does not respond. Um, I go to Lee MacArthur. Uh, thank you. Now the Scottish Government has admitted uh, to cooking the books, um, something that did the renewable sector no favours. Does the Minister believe that it is advisable for SNP MPs to double down on this statistic that has been admitted to be not true in the House of Commons earlier on this afternoon? Does she not believe that this will simply spread further fake news about the state of the sector? Minister. Uh, I welcome, of course, my Liberal Democrats co uh, colleague's newfound interest in statistical rigour, which I'm sure he will bring to any future uh, election materials yeah, as yeah. well. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, I repeat that yeah. Scottish ministers <laughs> understood yeah, yeah. that the statistic was accurate at the time that they cited it. Yeah, yeah. Now that it has come to our attention that it is not, we are working to up-to-date the statistics on how our offshore wind potential compares to other countries. Yeah, yeah. What hasn't changed is that potential, merely how we report it in comparison to other countries, yeah, yeah. which we will update in due course. Yeah, yeah. Well done. Yeah. Thank you. Question number two, I call Maggie Chapman. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to Baroness Helena Kennedy Casey's final report of the Independent Commission of Inquiry into Asylum Provision in Scotland, published on Friday, which highlights avoidable failings in the provision of care to new Scots during the COVID-19 pandemic. Cabinet Secretary Angus Robertson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I thank Baroness Kennedy and the Asylum Inquiry Scotland for its work. The Inquiry report is a shocking indictment of the UK's broken asylum system. It highlights the need for fundamental change so that the UK upholds its responsibility to recognise and protect people who have been forced to flee persecution and treats them with compassion, dignity and human decency at all times. The Scottish Government will respond to the Inquiry report and the Social Justice Cabinet Secretary has written to the Home Secretary seeking an urgent meeting to discuss the Inquiry's findings in the asylum system. 
Maggie Chapman. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. Of course, the tragic death of Badreddin Abdallah Adam and the injuries he caused to others were preventable. He had called the Home Office and two of their contractors 72 times seeking help. The use of institutional accommodation, such as hotels, is clearly not enabling the right support to get to people in a timely way. What more than this can the Scottish Government do while people are here to ensure that vulnerable adults and children, including survivors of trafficking, are not left in grossly inadequate institutional-style accommodation for indefinite periods of time without the vital specialist mental health support they need? Cabinet Secretary. I thank Maggie Chapman for her follow-up uh, question. And as she knows, asylum is a matter reserved to the UK Parliament. The UK uh, Home Office is responsible for the provision of asylum accommodation and support to people awaiting a decision on their asylum application. People seeking asylum should be accommodated within communities with access to the support and services that they need to rebuild their lives. The Scottish Government will continue to raise concerns and press for improvements to the UK asylum system. Maggie Chapman. It is clear that here in Scotland we are trying to do better than appears to be the case south of the border. The hostile environment rhetoric of invasions and deportation flights to Rwanda is not replicated by our government. But there is still more to do and things we can do here. Helena Kennedy's inquiry report has some clear recommendations for Scotland to act upon. Will the Cabinet Secretary and perhaps even the First Minister agree to meet Refugees for Justice, the survivors of the Park Inn tragedy and Baroness Kennedy to discuss immediate actions and future strategies that will better secure the rights of refugees? Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Social Justice Cabinet Secretary met with Baroness Kennedy last week and has also previously met with representatives of Refugees for Justice. The Scottish Government and our partners at the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities and the Scottish Refugee Council are preparing to undertake engagement to inform the refresh of our New Scots Refugee Integration Strategy, which we intend to publish next year. At New Scots National Conference last Friday, we asked people with lived experience and support services how we can enable people, communities and organisations to participate in engagement to shape that strategy. The New Scots Refugee Integration Strategy will continue to set out our partnership-led approach to supporting refugees seeking asylum and our communities from day one of arrival. Co-Cab Stewart. Thank you. As the constituency MSP for Glasgow Kelvin, where these unfortunate tragedies that were avoidable uh, referred to by the Commission took place, I was also able to attend the launch of the final report last Friday at Merchant's House. I asked the Scottish Government if it will join me in pursuing Recommendation 6 that calls on asylum accommodation support and care providers that they should immediately ring fence a fund of £5 million per annum for asylum seeker wellbeing, mental, emotional health support and trauma. There should be no profiteering from pain. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me on that? Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, may I begin by uh, commending uh, Kokab Stewart as a constituency member of the Scottish Parliament for her, her dogged pursuit of, of uh, justice in this uh, question. Uh, just to reiterate the point, the Scottish Government is still to respond uh, to the inquiry and will do that in good time. But I will make sure that my Cabinet Secretary colleague, who has ministerial responsibility for this area, looks very closely at the points that she makes, and if not in that inquiry response, that she writes to the member to update her on the position of the Scottish Government and the priorities that she's, uh, she's calling to her attention. Thank you. Question number three, Paul Sweeney. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to reports that nursing staff at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital in Glasgow are routinely left in charge of up to 30 patients and are forced to conduct 5 a.m. bed washes due to staff shortages. Cabinet Secretary Hamza Youssef. The Scottish Government expects health boards ensure that at all times there are sufficiently suitable qualified staff to support the provision of high quality care. This includes reviewing staffing levels daily with decisions regarding real-time staffing being made right throughout the day. It is my understanding that Greater Glasgow and Clyde does not ask nursing staff to carry out uh, any non-essential care for patients in the nighttime hours or indeed in the early morning. Uh, this is not their policy and that remains the case. Uh, the board also supplements wards with healthcare support workers to ensure tasks can be supported at appropriate times as part of that wider care team. Paul Sweeney. 
Presiding officer, the Cabinet Secretary will be well aware of the wider problems facing our National Health Service, spiralling waiting times, missed targets and indeed impending strike action due to the low pay have been routinely discussed in the Chamber and our common knowledge. But just last week, a whistleblower contacted me to express their grave concerns about the conditions that nurses and patients are facing at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital. They explained that nurses are, and I quote, frequently left in charge of up to 30 patients and how they are being forced, despite raising these concerns with management, to conduct deeply inhumane 5 a.m. bed washes of vulnerable patients due to severe understaffing. Was the Cabinet Secretary aware of this prior to the press reports on Sunday? And if he was, does he, tend, does he think that either scenario here is acceptable? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, so can I say uh, to Paul Sweeney, of course, uh, I'm aware and the government's aware of the extreme pressures uh, right across our acute sites, including, of course, the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital. Uh, having heard uh, the allegations that have been made, we saw immediate assurance from Greater Glasgow and Clyde, who are saying to us, and I will repeat uh, what they've said, uh, that, uh, that, that the policy remains, of course, that they do not ask nurses to carry out any non-essential care for patients. That includes uh, bed washes during the night or early morning, that is not the policy. Now, that being said, uh, clearly, uh, if Paul Sweeney has details of these allegations, I'm happy to, to speak to him, happy to speak to the whistleblower, uh, indeed, uh, off-table in a confidential space. I should also say that whistleblowing is important. I've met with uh, the whistleblowing champion in NHS Greater Glasgow, uh, and Clyde Charles Vincent, uh, and uh, reiterated to him the importance that I attach to whistleblowing. So if these issues have been raised to senior management, uh, and have not been uh, rectified, and that would give me concern. But as I say, I've sought those assurances from Gator Glasgow and Clyde, and they have told me that that is not routine practice. Paul Sweeney. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response and appreciate that the Cabinet Secretary might have been unaware prior to the press reports of this practice. But I would urge him to investigate this further, and I welcome his offer to meet with me and potentially with the whistleblower, should they be interested in doing so. And since the publication of that story in the Sunday Times, current and former, NHS staff have contacted me to say that this practice has been ongoing for years and is not exclusive to the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital. The reality is that nurse staffing levels across Scotland's health and social care services are dangerously low and patient care is suffering as a result. And that isn't my words, those are the words of the Director of the Royal College of Nursing in Scotland, Colin Pullman. So will the Cabinet Secretary, whilst acknowledging that this is an immediate issue that requires investigation, accept with some humility the decisions his government have taken over the last 14 years in power have resulted in staff being demoralised and overstretched to the point of industrial action and have left us with a system in our health service where staffing levels are so low that staff are being forced to conduct these inhumane practices despite the fact that it risks impeding a patient's recovery? Cabinet Secretary. I say that uh, if you look over the course of uh, the last uh, 10 years, we've seen nursing and midwifery uh, student intake numbers increase consecutively over, those, uh, over that decade. In fact, they're almost double uh, over that uh, decade in terms of uh, staffing and nursing staffing, in particular in Great Glasgow and Clyde. Uh, yes, I would acknowledge uh, that staffing uh, w has been a problem, continues to be an issue. But that's why I was really pleased to see that in Greater Glasgow and Clyde, nearly 600 newly qualified nurses and midwives uh, were well Welcome to the health board and started uh, their jobs in the last few weeks, and, and that uh, has helped to reduce that vacancy level. Uh, we have the highest uh, level, uh, record levels of staffing in the NHS uh, under this government. Best paid staff, uh, of course, uh, uh, in, in, in anywhere in comparison to the UK. Uh, but what I would say to Paul Sweeney is that nobody, uh, certainly not uh, myself or anybody else in the government, is complacent about those staffing challenges that exist, and that's why I will get back round the table, as you would expect, with our trade unions and our staff side representatives to make sure that we can do everything in our power to avoid strike action, which I know would be catastrophic for the NHS in the course of this winter. Sandesh Gohani. Nurses are doing their best and trying to deliver care at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital, but they are breaking point with overtime up and the Scottish Government is responsible. The Scottish Government does not have their backs and any semblance of trust the Cabinet Secretary had has been evaporated from staff, and patients. Working conditions in the NHS are so bad that 70% of nurses felt their last shift was compromised patient care and was unsafe. And with an NHS winter crisis fast approaching, this seems unlikely to improve. My question is what specific action will the Cabinet Secretary announce today? An action, not a woolly announcement, that he can guarantee will improve the working condition of nurses and thus patient safety, which was woeful before COVID 
with record 6,000 vacancies. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, again, I would reiterate that uh, I don't uh, have any complacency, neither does the government, around the challenges that are facing our NHS uh, staff and that is a, uh, in Scotland, and that is a problem that is faced uh, by health services right across uh, the UK. But it is worth noting, of course, that we have more qualified uh, nurses and midwives per thousand of the population uh, than in England. For example, we have 8.3 qualified nurses and midwives here in Scotland compared to six uh, in England. We also have higher staffing per head than other parts of the UK. Notwithstanding that, the rate, the rate of vacancies is too high, and that's why I stood in this chamber uh, a number of weeks ago and, of course, committed additional funding towards uh, international recruitment of 750 uh, overseas nurses, midwives and AHPs. What I would say to Sandish Gohani, uh, if he had any influence whatsoever, it would be better uh, if he was demanding that his party uh, uh, provided additional funding to the Scottish Government because, due to their, their economic incompetence, my budget is worth £650 million less. Emma Harper. Clearly, presiding officer, the NHS across the four nations faces re recruitment challenges in the current climate in attracting people with the right skills from out with the UK. Does the Health Secretary agree that comments such as those of Mr Sweeney's UK leader Keir Starmer don't reflect the welcoming nature of Scotland's NHS and that Brexit, which Labour now clearly backs, is a further barrier to recruitment in our NHS? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, 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 I do, but I mean, I would say, uh, in fairness, uh, knowing Paul Sweeney and, and knowing uh, Scottish Labour, uh, I don't think uh, those remarks from Keir Starmer reflect uh, their position. I know uh, from having spoken to many Scottish Labour uh, members that they are pro-immigration, and that's why I think they would share my disappointment and Emma Harper's disappointment around Keir Starmer's very divisive rhetoric. So there are really three elements to helping our staffing crisis. One is increasing the pipeline of graduates, and I've spoken about that already. The second is domestic recruitment. But they, the third prong, which is really important, uh, is overseas uh, recruitment. And I want to make it clear from my behalf, from behalf of the Scottish Government, that uh, if you are an overseas worker working at NHS, uh, your contribution is greatly valued. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. That concludes topical questions. There will be a brief pause before we begin the next item of business.